One time I was going, I was up country and walking in our village. My aunt, an old woman, was digging in the garden. I went to greet this woman. And I was chig away, she handles you. And you can't say you have a white shirt, even when she has the dirt, she holds you and the way chiga green. Eh? Then I said, why are you digging at this time? She said, ah, I'm not feeling well, but I have to dig. I said, why? She said, Omoro Tarwara, the poor do not fall sick. That thing entered my head. Eh? She didn't have money for medicine. So when I came back, I agonized over that for a long time. And I remember when I presented my proposal, the title was The Poor Do Not Fall Sick, Protection of the Right to Health in Uganda. And my supervisor, Professor Loko Nyangu, a man I respect, looked at it and said, yes, we can develop a proposal. And I decided to do a sub-county, Kashambia sub-county, on maternal health rights of poor women, the systemic and structural challenges, both macro and micro, that they were facing. And I employed both what we call doctrinal legal research and uh, empirical research from the social sciences intentionally to talk to these women, the main subjects of the study, what challenges like these pregnant women take. So a step backwards, in the middle of that program, Oroko Nyango says, why don't you start a course on health law? The subject was started by Esther Chisache. And after about one semester, I took it up, uh, revised the reading list, expanded it, and I had the pioneer students, including Moses Murumba, David Kabanda. Health law and policy was introduced to me by uh, Professor Ben, uh, then at the School of Law, when we are entering our fourth year. I read the reading list and realized that on the timetable we had a course that was called the Health Land Policy. I didn't know what was in this particular course. We never had access to phones as they are today. So I had to pay 500 shillings in one day in a, an internet cafe to do a quick Google search on what Health Land Policy involved. And I realized that in other jurisdictions, in the US, in Canada, they were actually specialists that were practicing health land policy. I was coming from a background of health professionals. We have doctors back home. My mom is a nurse. I had seen her practice. So being in a law school and seeing what I was seeing at home in the law books made a lot of sense and it evoked a lot of interest in me. So uh, fast forward, I meet colleagues. They wanted to do a law firm. I get co-opted into the idea of the law firm. And I tell them, you know what? The law firm is important, but my interest is in public interest in the health sector. So can I do a public interest wing within the law firm? Because I'd seen this in the US, I'd seen this in Canada, the few years that I'd interacted with the subject. And my colleagues don't think I appreciated where I was coming from, but they said, anyway, go ahead and do it. So we registered Sehad, just like that registered it very fast and began to look for work that was going to be um, happening. And, and I, I, along that time, reading newspapers, listening to the radio, there were a lot of maternal mortality, a lot of maternal deaths that were happening, and the whole country was struggling with the issue. And it got me thinking, wasn't it possible to actually challenge government from a constitutional point of view and actually argue that health issues are constitutional issues? Because I'd seen this in South Africa. I'd seen this on HIV AIDS treatment. Why wouldn't it apply to, to maternal health, you know? So before I knew it, I was convincing my colleagues about a potential case that we would do. And then another lady who was uh, working in open society, uh, Christine Munduru, had also picked up the same cases that we had seen on maternal death in Arua and Metiana. And we framed a case, um, a constitutional case, um, that later became Petition 16, the famous Petition 16. And the framing of Petition 16 didn't leave us the same. I remember that after we filed it, two days, the Daily Monitor picked it up as a headline, and the New Vision also picked it up as one of its headlines. 
and they published this and then organizations began to look for who were these lawyers who were suing government. Sayhad took us to court, the famous uh, uh, 16. It compels us to review all maternal deaths that happen in this country. And I want to tell you that all maternal deaths in this country are now being reviewed on a weekly basis, something unprecedented. It's not happening anywhere in, in the world. Like They are reviewing on a weekly basis, maternal death. So we are able to know, and we submit a report, a quarterly report, an annual report to the Speaker of Parliament, a quarterly report to the Health Committee of Parliament. So these are accountability mechanisms. They make us work better. On a number of occasions, we hear people being taken to court for criminal negligence, but we have a very strong arm that actually audits these maternal deaths, all of them. And we have confidential inquiries, which we don't share with the law because we want to use them for improvement. And improvement has happened. And uh, it's a continuous process because some of the gaps are really, really institutional or system gaps. So we come in and fix the system. They may not be on individuals, uh, but they may be system gaps. So um, um, when we, we, we have um, CSOs like Sehad coming up and, and saying, look, this is what has happened. So it's an accountability mechanism, and it does not only improve the Ministry of Health, maybe overall government. If finance has not given us money to recruit more midwives, and clearly it highlights you don't expect two midwives to work 24-7, in a health centre three, then you, you want to see more money coming in to recruit midwives, and I think that is the relationship. Uganda was recognised globally by its efforts to try and address reasons why women and newborns die. When they do, what is the response? Right from the national level, sub-regional, up to the level where the problem really, really occurred. And now there's also community engagement to inform them what the problem is and what they need to correct also at that level. So we do think that if this is further strengthened, it's a very positive way because it's practical, it's real time. We can only encourage government partners and the health facilities down there there has been an effort also to make sure that at the level of the regional hospitals, they are forming up their regional local maternity and newborn systems to deal with their local issues. Because different regions, different, yeah, regions have different challenges. And so where, whereas they attend to the national level process and platform, they also have a day in every week, each region has a day they relate to their own local issues with a view to improve what is happening in their own region. And their own leaders come in to support what their recommendations and efforts are. For me, the work on health land policy is not just about survival. It has become my way of life. It has become a practice that I take very, very, very seriously. We have picked up from Professor Ben, we have influenced other universities to begin teaching health land policy. You know, I have, I have taught it at UCU, I have been in, in the medical school and I've taught it. I have been beyond the faculties of law, in faculties of medicines, we've taught it. And the students we've taught are now becoming senior in the area of practice of health land policy. You know, we've litigated it, we've exposed it to judges. We've brought matters to judges where you know, people never thought that the judiciary had a role to play in the health sector, you know. So it's really been a practice that we've moved beyond the country to the East African community by influencing the laws and policies there on health land policy. We've moved to Geneva, I've been part of the World Health Assembly countless times and I've been part of the agenda. I've been in international conferences that are discussing health land policy. So it is a way of life, it is a practice. It is a profession that we are living today. For now, as a, a young generation of courts, to leverage on those wins in court, have them enforced, what did the people who conceptualize such a case have in mind? Have the orders been put into you know, implementation by government? Have they found their way into policy? Then beyond that, we, we also have the hope now that uh, litigation actually works. So as and when health challenges come up, we know that 
we are able to go to court and actually get something enforceable that, uh, that, that can find its way into policy because litigation, an order from court, is, 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 a, is a mandate, is, is a mandate on to whom the order is given to, to, to put in place what whoever is suing them is looking for. So, and we have seen wins, we have seen um, government being progressive in maternal health, for example, through that court ruling in petition 16, that our government is now conducting national maternal health audits to establish causes of death, to, to put in place measures to reduce maternal mortality. The other day, uh, the Uganda Bureau of Statistics released a report, demographic health survey, that revealed that maternal health has reduced considerably in the past couple of years. Yes, and that's such a win, but also a hope for the young generation. This is not just a problem for Uganda. How, would, how do we look at, because if it is a pandemic, if it is climate change, it's not going to be in the borders of Uganda. How do we collaborate with our neighbors, say Kenya, East Africa, Africa, how do we collaborate to have universal policies or universal programming that ensures that everyone enjoys the right to health for sustainable development? I must say that for the years that SEHAD has been in place, it has contributed immensely to the growth of health law and policy in this country. Because now we have emphasized a human rights based approach to health, using the human rights lens to analyze health looking at the social determinants of health in terms of demanding accountability from the state and non-state actors. I can now confidently teach about the right health. After 12 years of work in the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development, I personally felt personal satisfaction. I, I was satisfied with that, what I'd done. But I also felt I was getting fatigued. And I realized that in the space where we had begun as a virgin space, young people had taken over, you know? So my relevance, I began to evaluate it at a personal level and realized that I was not adding much more value because other people were already doing what I'd done. So I made a decision um, together with the board of trustees that I needed to actually move on. But the work that had done at the national level had not been done at a regional level. We have not had an African thinking around some of these frameworks. So lately, together with the team at Afia Nahaki, where I work presently, we are going deeper. Even the human rights frameworks, which we used to praise, you know, the, 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 the negligence frameworks that we've been using over time, I think we need to question them from an African point of view and think about more Afrocentric approaches, approaches that are contextual within the continent of Africa. And also begin to see the judgments that judges are giving us. Why are African judges deciding some things the way they are deciding them? You know, do we understand them? Are we communicating with them? Are we influencing them at a regional level? When we have the East African community and everyone is thinking about regionalism from a point of trade and politics, I think we need to infuse health systems and the law in regionalism. Is anyone thinking about it? I've not seen people think about it. And every time I wake up today, I see a relevant issue on regionalism at the East African community at the African Union level, which is very, very um, important for me. So my next phase of life in the next five or ten years, if I still have energy, I think I need to contribute to a more regional level as I continue to mentor more young people to get into the practice of health and policy. Mm -hmm.